I would like to thank all of you for dialing in, um, especially as it's turning out to be a really rather lovely evening outside. I would particularly like to thank the UK Statistics Authority. I know that David Norgrove is dialing in, I can see that Ian Diamond has dialed in and Jonathan Athlow for attending. And that level of engagement, when there is so much else going on, tells me how seriously UK Stats Authority are taking this. Um, what is slightly sadder is the, we don't have a representative from the Treasury who are also hosting this um, the consultation. And we did ask them to be involved. Um, they, they're unable to send a representative. And although the subject is very important, they clearly have other things going on, so they weren't able to prioritise this. But I hope that we're going to have a good discussion um, that will eventually feed through. I would particularly like to thank the Royal Society's National Statistics Advisory Group for organising the event, um, chaired by Steve Pennock, who has made sure that everything is working, um, ably helped by staff. So a little bit of background to the event. Some of you know this well, but some of you may not know it quite as well. The consultation was started earlier in the year on the Retail Price Index. And as part of that, we had planned a face-to-face -face meeting at our Errol Street premises. I was really looking forward to it. And I think it's fair to say it was one of the first serious casualties of the fact that we then couldn't meet in person because COVID was suddenly coming much faster than any of us appreciated. We managed to switch a couple of things to online, including the council meeting in March and indeed our interviews for our new chief executive. But we just couldn't get our heads around how to do a consultation meeting online. So we postponed it. Uh, we then got rather concerned that the consultation wouldn't be terribly effective, not just because we couldn't participate, but because actually anybody that might be putting into it at that point was trying to work out how to work from home, how to make their workplaces secure if anyone did have to go in. And quite frankly, we were thinking about just about everything except the retail price index. <clears throat> but if anything, the changes the economy has made proper consideration of this even more important. So we lobbied to make sure that the consultation period could at least be extended to allow for that and I'm very grateful that has happened and so what that means is we are still now in the consultation period and now we've all got rather more used to using teams meetings and discover that actually they have their advantages if anything they're rather more inclusive we thought right we we we, we know how to do this so hence we're having an online meeting um, that extension was warmly welcomed, among others, by Tony Cox from the RPI CPI user group. And I'm delighted that Tony is one of our keynote speakers today. So good coming out of this. I should remind you, your, your, your screen may tell you or it may not, that this event is being recorded as we did for the 2018 event on the future of the retail price index. So a recording and transcription will be available after the event so that we've got a record of it. Uh, what that also means is that if you use the chat function, please bear in mind that your intemperate comments will still be recorded for posterity. We don't have any way of editing them, so please use the language that you don't mind other people reading. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to help inform the Ross Society's response to the consultation. I'm expecting a variety of views, so I don't suppose everything will make it in unedited, but the chat can be used for that. So if you've got points that you want to make and that there may not be time to make verbally or are more appropriate by chat, please do put it into the chat because we will be able to catch it. I would also highlight that we've got an opportunity to submit written thoughts uh, before 9am, Wednesday 29th July to the RSS. And if you're reading packs, it tells you how to do that. And I'll remind you again at the end. But back to housekeeping for the, the next sort of part of the meeting. We have three presentations and then we're going to go into some invited contributions and then we'll go to a more free flowing question and answer session. Some people have already told us that they want to ask a question. So that's like the ground rules for each of those sessions. But we've got, first of all, three speakers, and I think I've got the order right, uh, Jonathan Atho, Tony Cox and Jill Leyland, 
who will have about 10 minutes each. And we will take those straight after each other without questions in between, because we've got plenty of time for questions later. So I'd like to let each of them have their say. Um, without further ado, then, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Aslow, who's the Deputy Na National Statistician for the UK Stats Authority. And for those of you who listen to today's programme, he's becoming rather a regular participant there, and I'm sure in other parts of the media that I don't necessarily tune into. So, Jonathan, um, over to you. Right. Th thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to take you on a, uh, a whistle stop tour of uh, of the consultation. Uh, I will give you a bit of sort of back quite a bit of background because I think that's really important to understand why the consultation was framed in, in, in this particular particular way. So I'll start off uh, with a few sort of statements that just for those obviously most of you will know all this RPI is one of a number of uh, measures uh, of uh, price inflation produced by the Office for National Statistics. We have come to see it as a legacy measure and I'll explain where that word legacy comes from. Um, we, we see a number of significant shortcomings. Now I know not everybody has the same view of view as, uh, as us on, on that, but that, that's our, our position. And we've come to discourage the, the, the use of it. We think there are better measures of consumer price inflation, CPIH being one, and also the household cost indices, which we published uh, an update uh, on, those, uh, on, the, on those today. So that's the background. So if I could go on to the next slide, please. Um, I, I, before I get into the uh, the detail, I will take you through a bit of the legal position. As again, I'm afraid this uh, does colour kind of how how the consultation is is, is structured. So, legislation, uh, Statistics and Registration Service Act, says two main things about the R, uh, the RPI. First of all, we must produce it every month, um, and secondly. If there are certain changes we make to it, then we need the agreement of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, and though that happens where there are changes to the, uh, the RPI that are fundamental and materially detrimental to the holders of certain index linked, uh, index linked guilds. Um, and uh, that judgment um, on whether they are fundamental or uh, detrimental is an issue for, uh, for the Bank of England to decide. And all of that is set out in legislation. I'll explain a little bit more how that then has led to our consultation as I take you through the following slides. So the next slide, please. Um, just to give you a bit of history um, on, on the RPI, obviously you can go all the way back to 2010 when we made some changes in clothing prices um, that really started what I think has been a sort of decade long discussion and re-evaluation of, 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 the, of the RPI. But the first consultation was launched in 2000, 2012 um, and uh, the sort of uh, the conclusion reached at that particular t time was that RPI didn't meet international standards, but there was no plans to change it uh, because we saw significant value to users at the time in leaving it uh, unchanged. Instead, what happened was uh, the uh, RPI lost its status as a national statistic. Then came along uh, uh, Paul Johnson and he did a review of uh, our inflation measures, a uh, pretty broad, broad, broad review. Um, that report is in 2015 um, and he sort of said a couple of couple of things. RPI should be considered a legacy measure. He wanted it used only where it was contractually required and uh, other uses, uh, other uses to stop. Um, and he was also talked about CPIH becoming uh, the headline, uh, the headline message. So that took us uh, up to uh, up to about 2017. If I could move on to the next slide, please. Then uh, there were a few things happened more, more, more recently. So in 2018, uh, the government said that it subjective was for CPIH to become the government's headline measure uh, over, over time. Um, and then a sort of key decision point was uh, the Lord's Economic Affairs Committee that they launched a, a report in 2018 that reported, I think, in January 2019. Um, and uh, I there was a, a very complex, uh, you know, detailed, detailed report, uh, but essentially they were saying, you know, we're still seeing widespread use of, 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 of RPI and this cannot be satisfactory. Um, that, you know, that, that view was it couldn't remain a legacy measure and therefore we need to address the shortcomings. So if I move on to the next slide, I'll explain then what our, our response was. So um, we, uh, the board of, of the UK Statistics Authority took advice from the then national statistician, and he made two proposals uh, around uh, RPI that um, uh, was uh, that, that were accepted 
by the by, by the board and formed our proposition that we put to the chancellor. So first of all, he said that RPI should stop. Um, we should stop publication. Arguably, if you know if, if it's not a good measure, the best thing to do is to stop its publication. Now, I should say the chancellor uh, ruled out. Uh, this option, stopping stopping RPI. So I'm not going to talk about it any further, but just for completeness, I did mention it was part of our a part of our proposal. But the alternative was then to uh, address the problems in RPI by bringing the methods and data of CPIH into uh, in, into into RPI. So that was the central central proposal. We put that to the Bank of England. They said it was uh, fundamental and materially detrimental, and therefore required the consent of the Chancellor. And the Chancellor responded. All of this was made public uh, in September. Um, he said he wasn't get willing to contemplate changes uh, to RPI before 2025, but wanted to consult uh, on whether to make uh, changes in a window between 2025 and 2030. Now, I haven't mentioned 2030 before, but essentially that's when the guilt with the particular protections in them that are covered by the legislation mature. So essentially that requirement to ask the Chancellor, seek the Chancellor's consent uh, uh, falls in, in 2030. So that was the Chancellor's response. So that's really led to where we are with the consultation today. If I could go on to the next slide, please. Um, uh, the consultation has sort of two parts to it. Um, as I said the Treasury is consulting on the appropriate timing, um, this 2025 20, to 2030 slot, and we are consulting on some technical aspects. Um, and in particular, the one I'll talk about uh, most is how you bring the methods of uh, of CPIH in, 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 into our RPI. So if I could just go on to the next slide, please. Um, so um, we're seeking feedback on this on the on this approach. We've put a, a proposal forward, and I'll, I'll take you through that. The other issue we are talking uh, to people about is the sub indices of uh, of of RPI. Um, we can't, in some cases, continue to produce those sub. Or in virtually all the cases, we cannot produce uh, sub sub indices of of RPI once we've imported the methods and data of CPI, CPIH. So we're seeking to understand what users. Are, are using those for so we can provide provide guidance. I won't talk about that in any more detail. But moving on, the way we plan to uh, to uh, so if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, excellent. The way we're planning to bring the methods of CPIH uh, into RPI is by chain linking, chaining. Um, this is a very common approach. It's essentially the approach we use when we update the basket uh, basket every year. And to put simply, what we're planning to do is the monthly growth rate of the CPIH series um, is going to be uh, applied to the index level of the RPI RPI level. Um, and I'll take you through what the consequences of, of, of that, that are. So if I could move on to the next slide, please. What we have done is we've we've put in the consultation document what this transition would have looked like if we'd have done it in 2017. Obviously, we've not done it in 2017, but that gives you an idea as to what's happening. So this is the calculation. We start with a with a white number, which is the um, RPI uh, index. We apply to that the CPIH growth uh, growth rate, which is the ratio in in sort of yellowy orange, and that gives you what this uh, this uh, this C, uh, this new RPI with the CPIH methods in looks looks like. So that's the simple calculation. Um, moving on to the next slide, I'll just take you through very quickly what that that looks like. Um, so the chart on the left shows what happens to the monthly growth path. And essentially, from the moment of transition, and as I said, we've chosen what, uh, what would have happened in 2017, we simply switch from uh, having a separate CPIH and a separate RPI uh, to, a, to a single uh, single index. What happens with the annual growth rate is that converges over 12, 12 months. And as you can see in the example here, there are some periods where that R RPI level is above, uh, is above CPIH, sometimes when it's below. There's no particular pattern that will depend on the data at the time, but it takes 12 months for those then, then to converge. And then you've got essentially the same methods and the same data informing both, both, both indices. So if I move on um, to the next slide, um, again, very simple for the index. The index just changes um, from the point at which, uh, which, uh, uh, which you start to, make, uh, start to make the change to the monthly growth rate. 
So um, that's um, the key thing in terms of how we're going to make the changes. If I move on to the next slide, uh, as I said, I probably won't, uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't say anything too much about the supplementary indices. We are interested in what people are using, so we can provide guidance on what the alternative would be in the new framework. And moving on to my final slide, uh, just to give, just to take you through what the opportunities are for uh, consultation. So there's an opportunity to respond online. There's a hyperlink uh, there. These can all be circulated afterwards. Uh, there's an opportunity to uh, uh, speak to the consultation team um, uh, via, via email. Uh, we've also got some engagement opportunities coming up. We've got an event, uh, event, event next week. As I said, this is a joint uh, consultation with the Treasury. So anything you send uh, to, to, to any of these addresses will be shared between the two departments um, uh, because uh, again it's just easier to do that way and uh, as Deborah said at the beginning we started this uh, consultation on the 11th of March extended it because of uh, because of the pandemic and it right so we've had five months of consult just over five months of consultation to, uh, to 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 August so that's all I want to say very very quick tour as I sort of said in one of my slides but didn't actually re read out um, I've covered a lot of ground there there's a lot of complexity a lot of detail here anything uh, that I that I may, may have uh, uh, you know covered over quickly the detail is in the consultation document that's the document of record um, so if there's anything we're missing or anything uh, I, I any ambiguity in what I've said that's the place to go and look okay thank you very much uh, for that uh, opportunity Thank you, Jonathan. That was a tour de force, both on the technical detail, but also on what it is we're consulting on and what we're not. So plenty of time later to ask questions. For now, we're moving on to the user perspective and Tony Cox is going to take us through that. Tony, it's all yours. OK, uh, so thank you, uh, Deborah, and uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, introduction to the consultation. Uh, as you've heard, I'm Tony Cox. I chair the RPI CPI user group. Um, the views I'm going to express here today uh, are informed by the user group and its members, uh, but they are my own. Um, so we should bear that in mind. OK, can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, so this afternoon, I want to make the case for why I do not think the consultation is transparent. Uh, it does not pay proper regard to the model of price indices as set out by the National Statistician in 2017, nor indeed to the advice the National Statistician provided to the UKSA board in 2019, uh, which Jonathan referred to in his slides. Uh, furthermore, it repeats a one-sided criticism of the RPI. Uh, the RPI comes in for a lot of criticism. Uh, the CPIH and CPI are, uh, should receive their fair share of criticism, criticism as well. And finally, and at best, I regard the consultation as being premature. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? Why do I say the consultation is not transparent? Well, mainly because it's not consulting on the fundamental proposal contained within it which is in effect to change the RPI into the CPIH, as you just saw in the slides Jonathan presented. After a year of transition, the RPI and the CPI will become, to all intents and purposes, identical. So it proposes to present one index, the CPIH, under two headings. One, the RPI, which is the still much trusted uh, name of uh, our familiar price index, and the other under its continuing title of the CPIH. But to all intents and purposes, the two indices will be identical. This is a fundamentally dishonest approach to the handling of the country's price, ind price indices. Furthermore, the proposed change is going to disrupt many existing agreements in unpredictable ways. Although the ONS is inviting information on the extent of affected agreements, it is unlikely that they can all be identified in advance. Furthermore, the change proposed will in any case create winners and losers on an arbitrary basis. Agreements entered into on an understanding of terms will be fundamentally changed to the benefit of one party and the detriment of another. Yet the parties to such agreements could have chosen the CPIH in preference to the RPI, but they made a deliberate choice to use the RPI, but they, they will now be forced to use what they had previously rejected. OK, can I move on to the next slide, please? The consultation betrays the UKSA's stated commitment to two classes of inflation measurement, 
That is a macroeconomic uh, family of indices and a household family of indices. There is scant reference to this important concept within the consultation document. While macroeconomic price indices are well served by, by two, the CPI and the CPIH, the household index family currently relies on the RPI. As Jonathan said, a new index is under development, the HCI, but is, it is not yet ready, and it's certainly not ready for use, widespread use. In his advice to the UKSA board in 2019, the National Statistician said, and I quote, it would be possible to align the RPI with the CPIH, which would meet the needs of those users seeking an index reflecting inflation according to economic principles. In this situation, those users who are seeking an index reflecting the impact of price changes on households should then be given the opportunity to use the HCIs. End of quote. So, in other words, the national statistician at the time was clear that the CPIH is an economic indicator of inflation and those requiring a household measure, measure should look elsewhere. He suggested towards the HCIs, but as I've just said, these do not yet exist in a, uh, in a usable form. It should also be pointed out that those users seeking an index reflecting economic principles are already well served with both the CPI and the CPIH. They hardly require another CPIH, but with the name of the RPI attached to it. The best that can therefore be said for this consultation is that it is premature as it is taking place before we have a fully developed and accepted new household measure of inflation. The, U the ONS has had 10 years to address the difficulty thrown up by changes to the collection in clothing data, but despite many suggestions has failed to tackle the issue. It is now attempting to wash its hands of that problem by also discarding a long running and trusted by many measure of prices. Can I have the next slide please? I think it is necessary to address uh, the uh, elephant in the room, as I've described it, uh, which is the objection of the authority to the use of the Carly formula. The consultation document at page 25, table one and the third row provides an example. I've taken that example and uh, given a, a more detailed um, uh, expansion of it uh, to provide clarity. Using the example provided in the consultation document, I've started with two identically priced items. The cost of each is 50p in 2019. One increases by five fourths in 2020 and now costs 62 and a half p. The other decreases by four fifths in 2020 and now costs 40p, as shown in, that, in this example on your screen. The Jevons formula uh, says that there's been no increase to the consumer. But in the real world of 2020, our consumer will find themselves unable to afford the same items for the same price as in 2019, as my slide shows. In fact, our consumer will now need one pound and two and a half pence. And lo and behold, that is the figure delivered by the Carly formula. The example provided is therefore a clear example of why the Carly formula continues to have a justified role in the compilation of price indices. The ONS has for too long been one-sided in its criticism of Carly and indeed the RPI in general, while neglecting the shortcomings of the Jevons formula and its preferred headline measure, the CPIH. It is worth mentioning that the other rows in this same table, if you refer to them, provide arguments for why the RPI is the superior measure of household inflation, but time does not permit a discussion in detail of those points. Can I have the next slide, please? However, I don't want uh, my comments uh, just now to be taken as an assertion that the Carly formula is the one to be used regardless of context. I'm merely asserting that all formula when used to estimate an average will have advantages and shortcomings. Jevons may well be the right formula in some cases, as will the Juto, another form of the arithmetic mean. This slide shows the extent to which formula and direct estimates of weights are used within the RPI and the CPI on which the CPIH is based. The table demonstrates that while Jevons is not used in the RPI, it does make use of a mix of both the Juto and the Carly formula. 
whereas the CPI uses the Givens almost exclusively with a very small percentage of the due term. It is also worth drawing attention to the greater use of weighted information in the RPI when compared to the CPI, which is generally re regarded as proving, providing the basis for a more accurate calculation. Can I have the final slide, please? In this short presentation, I hope I've demonstrated why I regard this consultation as lacking in transparency, failing to properly recognise the framework for price indices laid out by the former National Statistician in 2017, and that the consultation continues a history of unbalanced criticism of the RPI. Given the way that the CPIH falls short of the ONS's own plans to develop a household measure of inflation, adoption of it under the label of the RPI will fail those users requiring a household measure of inflation. So once again, the best that can be said for this consultation is that it is premature and should wait for the development and acceptance of an alternative household measure of prices. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I'm sure some will agree with you, some will disagree, but that was, I hope everyone will agree, that was a really clear presentation of your views. And again, I'm sure there will be discussion on those later. The third of the presentations that we're going to move to now is Jill Leyland, who I think is wearing a I mean, she's had various hats over the years, but she's now wearing a Royal Siskel Society hat and she's going to tell us about the future of the RPI, some alternative paths. So, Jill, over to you. Thank you very much, Deborah. And thank you, Jonathan and Tony. Um, yes, I'm going to talk what, a bit about the RSS view. What I'm going to say is not the RSS view in its entirety because there is some overlap between what the RSS thinks and the user group thinks and you didn't want to hear Tony and me saying the same thing twice. So if I could have the first slide or next slide, please. So I hope I'm going to be able to make three main points. First, that we only have partial knowledge about the use of the RPI and or indeed of consumer price indices generally and of the um, users and, and what the needs of those users are. Second, that the landscape of consumer prices that Tony has mentioned that was set out in 2017 makes a distinction between economic or some people will refer to it macroeconomic indices such as CPI and CPIH and household indices such as the uh, household costs indices. And the RPI is essentially a household index. And third, there are other options and we have time to reflect. Could I please have the next slide? It's long been recognised that you need different consumer price indices for different uses. And on this slide, I have a quote from the Consumer Price Index Manual, the International Manual, which is published by um, the ILO, the IMF, OECD, United Nations and other eminent international organisations. And that says, while the general purpose of a consumer price index is to measure changes in the prices of consumption goods and services. The concept of consumption is an imprecise one that can be interpreted in several different ways, each of which may lead to a different um, index. So understanding user needs is therefore important. Could I have the next slide, please? But our knowledge is very patchy. Some areas we know quite a lot about. We know about its use in policy, um, the use of the CPI as the Bank of England inflation target, for example, um, the use of indices as regulated um, in regulated prices. We know quite a bit about the use of indices in pension funds, index linked gilts and so forth. Maybe something about their use in um, wage negotiations. But we know very little, for example, about others such as their use in business contracts. The consultation has questions which ask about the impact of the proposed changes. Um, Whereas we, but apparently the decision has already been made about what we are going to do. And this seems to be the wrong way around. I can't help thinking about a par the parallel with 2010 when this whole saga about the RPI started. And it was the result of changes made to the price, way clothing prices were collected, changes made with extremely good intentions but disastrously, they were not tested before implementation. So the 
impact of them was not appreciated. And now it seems in some ways we're doing the same thing, making changes without full knowledge of their impact. Jonathan mentioned the Johnson review. There are a lot of good things in that review, but there is one thing that it did not do. And this is perhaps something that's not particularly widely realized. It did not look particularly closely at user needs, particularly outside the public sector. If you look at the appendix to the uh, review, you will find a list of just 15 organizations consulted, and only four of those were not official bodies. However, we do have some knowledge, even if not as good as we would, would like. And as already mentioned, in February 2017, the former national statistician set out a landscape of consumer needs. Could I have the next slide, please? And this is a direct copy of John Pollinger's slide. Um, econ uh, economic principles, which a need which would be met by CPI and CPIH. Household experience, which John Pullinger um, envisaged being met by the household costs indices. And finally, the RPI for all the existing long-standard contracts where RPI was mentioned, and it is very widely used indeed. And that he saw the RPI still being used. That landscape seemed to us in the RSS to make a lot of sense, and I don't think we were alone in that. Now, CPI, CPIH and RPI will, I'm sure, be familiar to you all. Household costs indices, less well known. They've been already been mentioned by the two other speakers. They are experimental indices, as was said. And as Jonathan also mentioned, the latest iteration was published at 9.30 a.m. today. I had hoped to have a slide showing some key results, but unfortunately, um, we had some power cuts where I live in the morning, coupled with loss of internet, and this just made it not possible. But I do urge you all to have a look at them. Um, just Google household costs indices and ONS or something like that, and you should get through to them. And you will see, for example, how the inflation experience of households in different categories has varied. For example, the difference between households in different income deciles, uh, for households with and without children, and for retired and non-retired households, and so forth. Could I have the next slide, please? What exactly there were the differences? Because although we have these two concepts, if the differences are not very great, it really doesn't matter if we only have one index to, to cover the two. But so let's have a little look at some of the differences. These, this is only a, these are only some of them. Economic indices are plutocratic weighted, to use the term that is commonly used, whereas household indices are democratically weighted. Plutocratic weighting, and this is the need for economic indices, when you weight together the items that go into a consumer price index, you want their weights to reflect their use overall in the whole economy, how much money is spent on each item overall. This means, of course, that households that spend more which typically are richer households, will have more influence than poorer, lower spending households. Household indices attempt to um, weight all the indices, or sorry, all households similarly, or get as close to that as we can. And research by the ONS has shown that this can make quite a, quite a big difference. Um, economic indices are based on economic definitions as far as possible whereas household indices are very much based on household experience. So for example, economic indices exclude interest payments while household indices include them. Um, household uh, indices look at expenditure by residents, whether that's in the UK or ideally, if possible, abroad, whereas economic indices include all expenditure in a country, whoever makes it. And there are a number of others, treatment of owner-occupied housing, for example, that can make quite a difference. Could I have the next slide, please? And if you look at the original purpose of the indices we have, um, CPIH is essentially CPI with a couple of additions, and CPI is the EU's harmonised index of consumer prices for the UK. And the harmonised indices of consumer prices 
were designed, and this is a quote from the EU regulation that established them, for the purpose of providing comparisons of inflation in the macroeconomic context, that's things like inflation targeting, as distinct from indexes for national and microeconomic purposes, such as compensation. The RPI, if we look at it, it's, at its history, was originally designed right back in the 1950s for wage bargaining as its prime purpose. So it was designed to reflect the experience of the target households who would be affected by wage negotiations. And while its, its use expanded over the years, it still had this idea of reflecting um, household experience. As the 1986 advisory committee said, for the index to be of value, it must be generally regarded as relevant to people's concerns and a fair reflection of their experience. So it's essentially a household index. So why turn it into a macroeconomic one? Next slide, please. There are other options. The former Chancellor's decision to delay any change until at least 2025 gives us time. I believe, and I'm fairly similar to Tony here, that the RPI only has one real flaw, that is the combination of um, the Kali index with the way that clothing prices are collected, and that could be mended. Other flaws, so-called, are, th are decisions that were made at the in the past and were considered properly by the advisory committees of the time and made for good reason. You may want to review them as time has passed, but you can't really call them flaws. Turning back to the one floor I do see, uh, we are going to have scanner data, which will give us a lot more opportunity to use weighted indices, and that should come on stream in the next few years. And then, of course, the household costs indices will be more fully developed. So I do hope that there will be a review. Could I have my final slide, please? Up to now, what I have said reflects so far the RSS views, although obviously they will evolve uh, largely as a result of this meeting. But I want to end on a personal thought. In the 50 years that I've been in of my working life, I've been a user of ONS statistics or in the past CSO statistics. And for, for most of those years. ONS is at its best is a world leader. At its best, it's open minded. It has a sense of discovery. It's innovative. It, it listens, it has expertise, but the RPI saga has been a very sorry one. Sometimes the ONS has looked a bit like the rabbit in the headlights. I do hope that there will be a change, not just for all the reasons that Tony and I have mentioned, but because I think the ONS is better than what it is proposed at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. So again, very clearly put. And I'd like to thank our three keynote speakers for sticking so well to time, despite them all having a lot they want to get across. So that's left us with plenty of time to start opening it up. We've asked four attendees to sort of make a bit of a statement. Um, so I thought we were going to invite your contributions before the pre-submitted questions. So can we take that slide down just yet? Um, because we're going to go to Ashwin Kumar from Manchester Metropolitan University. And I think all four of you have been advised that you've got about four minutes. So if it's more than that, I shall start leaning in. If you see my camera going on, you'll know. Um, but Ashwin first. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, so I'm at risk of repeating some of what Jill has already said, but let me let me start where I'm coming from. Um, as a former chief economist at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, as someone whose who's work involves looking at incomes and poverty, um, the, one, of, one of my principal concerns with economic statistics is the tyranny of the average in communications of economic statistics. Um, just to take an example, if you look at house prices, go back to the pre-recession peak and house prices in, in the northeast of England are 5% lower than they were in the pre-recession peak. But in London, they're 61% higher. And if we hear on the news, the national average, well, that's 25% up. 
If you live in the northeast of England, that statistic is utterly meaningless to you. And one of the problems that we have in our economic conversation is there isn't space really to reflect this diversity. The news will only have one inflation figure or one house price figure. So one of the one of my key criteria for for um, uh, price statistics is the ability to reflect the diversity of experience. And uh, so for me, one of the things that that means is democratic weighting is absolutely crucial. The second, which is really important, is disaggregation by subgroup. Um, the household cost indices, um, the latest iteration of which was published today, show, for instance, that inflation in the last year has been higher for people in lower income deciles. And it's incredibly important to allow that capacity. I'd also want to be able to see users have the ability to generate their own weights to be able to look at specific subgroups. If I'm trying to analyse the relationship between lone parents um, and benefit income, for instance, and other sources of income compared to their costs, I want to be able to generate a price series, uh, a price inflation series for that particular subgroup. As others have said, CPI is firmly in the macro camp. For me, what that means is that we need the household cost indices. Um, the RPI doesn't have the democratic weighting, um, and I don't see it as a saviour. The exclusion of households whose, um, whose pensioner households whose income relies on state benefits is an important exclusion from my point of view, and it means that actually quite a lot of change needs to happen to the RPI before it can be used for the purposes which I need. Um, another example is the uh, is the dependence on house prices um, influencing the index. As we saw, there is so much diversity on a geographical basis between house prices. Um, I wouldn't want that necessarily to affect the presentation of the picture that people see in the shops. So my conclusion is that um, I agree that it was not acceptable for the RPI to be left as a legacy benefit with shortcomings, given that people are using it. It, it needs to be changed. My view is that the household cost indices are really the direction for change. I'm relaxed, therefore, about whether the RPI is moved towards CPI or towards the household cost indices. What I'd really like to see is the household cost indices to be built up and to become the item that people talk about in the news when they say what's happening to prices in the shops. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Ashwin, and um, beautifully within your time. Um, so we're going to move to the other three and then at the end of these I'm going to ask the panel um, speakers if they want to respond to anything before we then open it up rather more widely. So the next person in this series is Jonathan Camfield who's from Lane, Clark and Peacock. Thank you very much Deborah and thank you for the invitation to uh, speak to the meeting. Uh, I should mention that I'm uh, a member of the advisory panel for consumer prices uh, and also, as you've said, a partner at LCP. Um, but today I'm speaking in a, a personal ca capacity. So at LCP, we advise over 40 percent of the FTSE 100 on pension matters. We're actuaries and that includes advice relating to inflation. Um, RPI reform is expected to have a range of impacts on pensions, uh, which I'm going to briefly comment on covering three key areas of pensions themselves, uh, investment markets and pension deficits. So first, pensions themselves. If RPI is to be around 1% per annum lower from, for example, 2025, then any pension that is linked to RPI will increase around 1% per annum lower in the future. And in the long term, I know it's a statement of the obvious, this will clearly be less money in pensioner pockets. It's worth considering who is impacted. Uh, it's not state pensions or public sector pensions. These are already linked to CPI. And, and it's not the, the modern so-called DC pensions that the majority of the UK's private sector workers are now in. It's the older style DB final salary pensions, the vast majority of which are now closed, uh, and have pro they've promised pensions to around 10 million people. Survey evidence suggests that around 70%, 7 million pensions are still linked to RPI, uh, and these can now therefore be expected to be lower in the long term. Um, you can look at this in two ways. Uh, some would argue this is deeply unfair. Pensioners were promised RPI and are now being provided with some, something less than that. Uh, others would argue that these pensions have increased by more than 
true economic inflation in the past, particularly over the last 10 years with the clothing issue we've heard about. They've had a windfall uh, and it's now only appropriate to correct this error now, albeit with some warning. Uh, secondly, the investment markets. Uh, many pension schemes own index linked gilts, which are linked directly to RPI. This current is currently this market's worth around eight hundred billion pounds. Uh, some estimates suggest that the vast, vast majority of it is owned directly or indirectly by pension schemes and insurance companies uh, to give them a secure asset to back the pension payments that they've promised. And um, this is why, in my view, a clear roadmap for the future of inflation is really important because financial markets depend on clarity. Uh, my view is that a solution that involves a series of consultations, of tweaks, of improvements to the RPI would, wouldn't have been appropriate for these markets. And thirdly, this brings me on to the financial position of, uh, of pension schemes and deficits. Uh, this is the amount of money that sponsors uh, of pension schemes are asked to pay into schemes. Uh, there's a wide range of such financial impacts of RPI reforms. Some schemes will definitely be net losers. And in the more extreme cases, employers will need to pick up additional costs of more than one billion pounds. In other cases, there'll be little impact. Uh, and maybe in the majority of cases, the scheme and hence the employer will actually end up gaining financially. I'm just going to conclude briefly by summarising my reading of the likely response to the consultations from the pensions and investment world. I expect that the vast majority of responses will be supportive of reform, recognising flaws in RPI, but calling for compensation for users recognising the impact on pensioners and, and some, some schemes. But there will also be some responding from the pensioners world to support reform with no compensation, as in their view, they think it's fair, a fairer outcome for pensioners and it also improves the funding of many pension schemes. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So you've outlined a very important perspective and I sh should be reminded to declare conflict of interest, of course, I'm nearer my pension than many people on this call. Um, so we're moving on now to Robert and Neil, who is from Manchester University, as opposed to Manchester Metropolitan University that we heard from a few minutes ago. So Robert, over to you. Hi, yes. So uh, just to say, um, I'm at University of Manchester now. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we've heard it mentioned a few times, and I've had a chill go up my spine every time it does the... I was at ONS as part of the team working on the 2012 consultation on a not dissimilar but not quite the same issue and I've written a, uh, a few books on the RPI and the inf index numbers since. Um, I think it's interesting that in a way not a lot of the uh, conversation around the differences between CPI and RPI has necessarily moved on a lot since then, um, particularly when it comes to the strengths and weaknesses and which is best and which is uh, the optimal index to use, which I'm fully convinced that um, no two groups of people or no two people within a group will ever completely agree both on what the right index to be using um, or the right basis for using that index is. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've had this weird, uh, this odd uh, historical artefact because of the way we, we chose to do things where we've had the RPI and the CPI, which led us both into this situation, um, neither of which are indices which changed, the ex which stay exactly the same throughout their history. Um, and this focusing on the difference between them has, I think, at times taken away from uh, wider um, discussions, which uh, other people have touched on about ways to get better measures of index, which wouldn't necessarily um, be um, either of the versions um, as they are. Um, so I think it's it's one of these things where, yes, there are differences and yes, there are differences of opinion and it's not a difference of fact about which is better than the other. Um, so I think it's always going to be a very different or very difficult process. But I think at some point um, from my reading of the situation that it, there might be an argument made that uh, this ongoing debate, which is being, ha being had for well over a decade now, and if you look back at the life of the RPI much, much longer than that, uh, it might be the case that this is one of those debates that's getting in the way of improvements uh, for things like better household indexes and uses of scanner data. Um, so that's all I have to say or to add. 
Thank you very much, Robert. And again, nice succinct comments. The final discussant in this part is on vital contribution is from Chris Giles from the FT. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I'm just going to make a few brief comments as well. I think just we want to know, uh, we've, there's been some talk about it in so far about this being premature, the consultation. Uh, I think this is really not premature. We've had a decade where we've been messing around with the RPI and then thinking about what to do about it. And it really should have been sorted in 2012. Uh, but we don't need to revisit that decision. We just need to sort it out now. The status quo as we speak is untenable. That was very clear. Uh, came out of the Lord's Eco uh, Economic Affairs Committee uh, because at the moment the ONS is simply not following the law, not following the Statistics and uh, Registration Services Act of 2007, which says it has to promote and safeguard the quality of official statistics. The uh, RPI is an official statistic and it couldn't continue by saying we don't think it's a very good statistic, but we're going to do nothing about it. So the only way it could follow the law essentially was to do pretty much what it did do. And I really commend the, uh, the UK Statistics Authority and the ONS for finally biting the bullet and performing what is always difficult in public policy, a big U-turn last year and saying it wanted to first of all abolish the RPI, something the Chancellor was always going to uh, disagree with but then having a backup plan to do pretty much what it wants. The 2030 date is very, very significant in law because after 2030, when all the index linked bonds have matured that have the clause in them, which says you have to go through the Bank of England and then the Chancellor before you can actually make any fundamental change, those die. And then at that point uh, in law, it says that the relevant gilt edge securities will not exist anymore. So ONS or the UK Statistics Authority, the board, can do what it likes and it has chosen to do it, it's been decisive and again I would commend them uh, for that uh, decisiveness after a period in which it very much didn't do that for many years after the 2010 clothing decision. There will of course be quite a lot of moaning and special pleading uh, and we see hard luck stories, in fact the Financial Times wrote up a hard luck story just this morning. It's online as we speak, saying that up to 10 million pensioners will face a, a worse future if you if they move the RPI to something like CPIH. But what I was very encouraged by, if you look at the comments underneath that ar article uh, today, that the comments have moved very, very significantly in the direction of people being rather critical of that sort of special pleading. I'm just going to read the top three recommended comments. One is that if you listen quietly enough, you might be able to hear the faint noise of the world's tiniest violin. The second most recommended comment was up to 10 million pensioners face being paid a pension that better reflects price increases. And the third one was what matters most is not which is higher, but which is the more reflective of the cost of living. And one thing we do know is the RPI has not been reflective of the cost of living in many years. And the way it's interacted with public policy meant is that we redistributed very significantly from young people to old people, from poor people to richer people. And so the fundamental choice the uh, UK Stats Authority made was to sort that out. And I very much commend them for that. Of course, you can choose another index. And it's also exactly what the ONS is doing to have household cost indices. It's just that, that we can have those sitting alongside the new RPI and that will be a perfectly acceptable situation for future. So I think the current situation, the consultation is very welcome. It's welcome that it's cons consulting on the date. 2025 is clearly better than 2030. In fact, it should be now, but we don't have that choice in front of us. So the what the ONS and UPS have done, I think is just fine. It's just coming a little bit too late. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, so thank you to all four people giving invited comments there. Um, and I think that illustrates the range of views we've got, which is actually why this consultation is so important to listen to those and then um, try and steer a way through it, both the RSS to respond to consultation and then uh, Treasury and UKSA as to what to then do. So at this point, we're going to sort of do a little bit of taking stock before we move to a rather more free flowing question and answer. And what I'd like to do is to invite the 
three keynote speakers if they would like to respond to anything they've heard so far in the meeting from these, well, it could be from each other or from these uh, four speakers. Don't feel you need to respond to everything because clearly we want to have other <coughs> comments, but I would like to give you a chance to pick this up so that it doesn't get lost. Um, so I will turn first of all to Jonathan Atho, then to Tony, then to Jill to respond. And then after I've done that, I will come up with the rules for the question and answer session afterwards. But Jonathan, have you got anything remarks you'd like to make at this stage? There was just a, a couple of things uh, I, I would, would would bring out. One person asked um, about a question on the, on the, on the consult, consultation on the, on the substance. Uh, I mean, I think here I would sort of build on, on some of the things we, we, we've heard that actually this has been a long running uh, issue. I think many of the substantive issues have been extensively discussed um, say for the last last 10 years or so we had the consultation with Paul Johnson and the Johnson review uh, we had a lot of discussion around uh, many of these issues uh, in the it, it, that informed the Lord's Economic Affairs Committee so I, I think many of these issues have been uh, have been well aired I mean one of the things I would reflect on uh, as well is, is, is what we've heard is you know the idea you know, I'm, I'm not certain a consultation will arrive at consensus. There are really strong, strongly held views uh, on on this, and we, we've uh, we've he heard a lot of those. The other one I would reflect on um, is, is is really picking up on what what Jill, Jill, Jill said about the choice of of, of CPIH. I would encourage people to, um, if if they're they're interested, to look at the advice that the then National Statistician put to the uh, to the UK SA board, and really that was. That was what underpinned uh, the, the, the first best uh, option. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm summarising what he said would be to stop RPI because then people would have a choice about whether they would uh, they wanted to move to CPI, HCPI, uh, household cost indices, or, 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 or some something else. So that was seen as very much the, 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 the first best. But as I said, the Chancellor said that he wasn't willing to uh, go, go down that, that particular 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 route, and that. The option then um, was uh, then the sort of a good option um, was the one that we, we we put forward to bring the methods of, of CPIH and CPI into into RPI. So there is a bit of nuance there that I, I think uh, it, it'd be worth if people are interested in just looking through that advice about kind of how we got to those particular those particular decisions. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Tony Cox, is there anything you want to respond to at the moment or pick up on? Uh, yes, I, I, I think it is worth just picking up on some of the points that have been, uh, been very well made, actually. I think the first point I'd like to make is that there is an underlying assumption. A lot of people seem to think that the CPI gives us the true measure of inflation. Of course, the reality is we don't know the true rate of inflation. We just make efforts to get as close as possible to what we think is the true rate. Um, and some people think that the CPI delivers that. Some people think it's the CPIH and others think it's the RPI. But the truth is we don't actually know. So I would just caution against this um, assumption that the CPI is the correct measure and therefore the RPI is, because it's normally higher than the CPI, uh, is incorrect and is higher in some way. Um, so that's what one point. I would echo Jonathan's point actually about um, looking um, carefully at what the National Statistician advised the board back in 2019. I think that does repay uh, visiting and I think it's more nuanced, in, at least in my view, it's more nuanced than uh, Jonathan was just suggesting. Uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure if people can still hear me. I've suddenly... Yeah, no, I can still hear you. Oh, great. OK, my screen just went uh, blank, but I think I'll leave it at that for now. Those were the two points I, I, I wanted to make. Oh, perhaps just one other point. I, just picking up, guys, saw in the comments somebody was querying my example uh, and saying that uh, in the example I gave, it doesn't account for people choosing to buy the cheaper item. And of course, that may well be true. People may choose the cheaper item. But in, in my view, that is not giving a true measure of inflation. Uh, the uh, measure is supposed to be objective and say, well, how much have prices gone up by? Not take account of people's reaction to those changes in prices. This can be a philosophical point, but I think it is an important one. OK, I'll leave it at that. That's a fascinating debate, but possibly beyond the scope of this meeting. Um, and then some may argue even with that. OK, Jill, have you got anything you'd like to respond to at this stage? Yes, thank you, Deborah. 
Um, I agree with Tony's point about that, that we do not know the um, what inflation actually is. But I have one other point I wanted to pick up. Um, I was struck, Robert O'Neill made a very important point, I think, and that is that all these issues about Carly Jevons and what happened in 2010 and the subsequent thing have actually taken us away from discussing some of the more important issues. Now, Chris Giles said that we've had um, a decade of discussion and, um, you know, we really don't want any more, but I think that is the problem. The discussion has not been about the things that really we should have wanted to discuss. So we haven't really got some of the answers we would want. I think that in this respect, not in all respects, but in this respect, the Johnson Review really was a huge missed opportunity because it didn't look closely enough at what the needs were. So that's why I still think we need some reflection and consultation, tiresome as it may seem after what we've gone through in the last 10 years. That's all for now. Lovely. Thank, thank you, Jill. So that really does bring us to the halfway point of the meeting. And I think that has set out an awful lot of the issues. What we're doing now is to move to question and answer. And the first four we're going to take are ones that were pre-submitted. And we'll take those in two pairs and I'll give the um, speakers a chance to respond to those. But we'll, say we'll take them two at a time just to kind of make things slightly more efficient in terms of timing. After that, we're going to take them from the floor. And there are two ways of doing that. And um, that's at least partly because different people have different functionality, depending what machine you've got and what version of Teams. So you can either raise your hand and I can see that at least one participant has raised their hand so far. Or you can type into the chat saying that you want to ask a question. And what I'm going to do is that Jonathan Everett from the Royal Society staff is going to give me a heads up about what we do in what order, because um, some of the questions group, some of them don't really need an answer now, some of them are comments, but he's going to steer through about what order we take things in. But if you want to speak, either put your hand up using that function or put it into the chat. So. The first two questions, oh, and what I should say is that everyone who speaks, can I ask you to say where you're from, but also if there's any, or what hat you're wearing, but also if there's any com potential conflicts of interest to be aware of. It's not that you shouldn't speak, but it's just best to have these things out on the table. So we've got two pre-submitted questions that I'll read out and then go to the um, speakers. So the first, which I think would interpret as quite a broad question here, which is will ONS publish a balanced argument analysis of the UKSA proposal for the retail price index, including the counter arguments before any decisions are made? And then Daniela Silcock said, as we're already changing indices, so in other words, taking that as read, does the panel think it's politically feasible and practical to explore at the same time using a separate officially recognised pensioners index to upgrade government benefits, pensioners and pension payments from schemes and insurance? So in other words, taking it that this is going ahead at some point, but that maybe we need something different for some purposes. And I'm going to, I won't every time turn to Jonathan first, but I think these questions are so clearly in his court that it would be silly not to. So Jonathan. Uh, so, uh, others are going to go Jonathan, Jill, and then Tony. Fine. So, so just on, on Arthur's comment, I, 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 I've just referenced. Um, I, I think what the, the analysis or the advice that the then National Statistician put to the board does exactly that of looking at different options, whether it's the status quo or or, or alternative uh, alternative options. So that was the sort of balanced. Um, I think has, has balanced his advice, uh, his, his advice to the board, and and, and the board um, took 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 account took account of that. So I think that's uh, I would would encourage Arthur to have a uh, have a look at that. Daniela's point is a really interesting one. Um, uh, as as a couple of people have mentioned, we published today the household cost indices looking at retired versus non-retired uh, re re retired uh, households. I think there's some interesting, you know. There's nothing practical to stop uh, to, to 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 stop this. I mean, there's a couple of observations. One, while there have been some differences in 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 costs for pensioner and non-pensioner households, certainly in recent years they've not been that large. Um, and one other point 
um, which is not a statistical point, but one I've been hearing, and I, I, I think uh, and Jonathan um, Camfield made, is there is an issue, I think, with pensions about if you have a different index for the uprating of a, of a pension or an annuity from the instruments that are matched to hedge it, that can cause problems for um, for, uh, for for uh, pension uh, schemes. So I think there are or insurance companies. So I, I think there are some interesting issues there on the sort of practical side from the uh, financial uh, financial services services industry. But in terms of practicalities, it's certainly possible. And we, as I said, we've published uh, different sorts of uh, different uh, versions of the household cost indices looking at exactly these sorts of issues. Thank you, Jonathan. Jill, have you got anything you want to add at this stage? Yes, thank you, um, Deborah. Um, Jonathan, I think you rather swept aside Arthur's point. Um, yes, there was there were obviously some pros and cons in John Pullinger's letter to the board that you mentioned, but I, it was a fairly summary arguments, and I don't, I wouldn't really say it's a full analysis of them. Um, can, turning then to Daniela's point, uh, obviously it's not for me to say whether it's politically feasible or indeed to say um, how desirable that would be from the point of view of the pensions industry, although as Daniela works for the Pensions Policy Institute, I guess she's got a good idea of that. Um, it's certainly practical to have a separate index and indeed the household costs indices for retired households would seem to be certainly getting there if not already there um, if that is what people want and of course it's not just the pensions industry itself that should discuss this but also um, both pensioners and pension pension fund trustees would have something to say uh, Jonathan mentioned yes the issue about index link gilts that's another issue again it's not really for me to say um, my understanding is that a something like 90%, Jonathan Camfield probably knows this, um, of index link gilts are used to hedge pension fund liabilities, either directly or indirectly. So that proposes another argument. Um, whether you would need a series that's exactly the same or not, or whether it could be roughly the same, I think um, there are a lot of, lot of questions about it, but that's not for me to say and indeed it is practical to have such an index. OK, thank you. And Tony, anything to pick up on these questions? Well, not much to add to what's just been said, I think. But uh, yeah, I would agree that um, uh, it would be very useful to have a balanced analysis of the uh, UKSA proposal, uh, including counter arguments. Um, that's something that we haven't seen. Um, so far, and that would be extremely helpful. Uh, as far as pensions are concerned, this is, a, this is more of a political question, really, whether or not pensions should be uprated uh, according to a price index or whether it should be with average rise in, in wages or some other measure. Uh, are all uh, decisions for the you know for the wider population to take i think it's not one of the problems with the whole debate has been tying it into pensions and pensioner up rating whereas i prefer to look at the need for a household index as being to, uh, as providing information about what the prices uh, that we face in the shops are, or not just the shops, but services as well, um, and providing information about the way the economy is operating. And then whether you use it to uprate pensions or not becomes a political issue. OK, thank you very much indeed. So I think we've had responses from the speakers on those. So can we now move to the second pair of pre-submitted questions? Um, so one of them is from Kevin Russell, who is from Unison, who said that in the development of the household cost indices, is it the intention of UKSA that any of those indices were based on an arithmetic mean? And then Derek Benson, Benstead from First Actuarial said that the way price data is collected and fed into an index formula can affect the outcome. For example, it was seen in 2010 that reformed collection of clothing data resulted in a widening of the difference between CPR and IPR. Is it possible to reform the collection of price data in a manner which would narrow the gap between CPI and RPI? For example, could electronic data collection result in a greater volume of data being collected, a greater consistency over time the data collected have the consequential effect of narrowing the gap between CPI and RPI, and if so, would RPI increase? So a lot of questions 
packed in there. And I think I'm going to go in reverse order of the speakers, actually. So I'm going to go to Jill and then Tony and then to Jonathan. Um, so Jill. Yes, thank you, Deborah. Um, taking Kevin's question first, I very much hope that the household costs indices will not, as they are currently, um, be heavily dependent on the Jevons index, because I think you need to look at each item separately and then decide which index is better. When John Aston and I originally put out our proposal, which has been used by ONS in developing their indices, um, we, we put out our paper in 2015, we thought that something like um, the index choice that was used in RPIJ, which was a mixture of Jevons and Duto, we always forget Duto, but it's um, as used, it's quite a good index in many ways, um, would be better. The other point, of course, is that ONS is working hard on looking at scanner data from supermarkets and so forth, and that tells you not just the price of things, but also the quantity that is bought, which of course means you can start developing a weighted index, which means you don't have to use elementary indices like Carly and Javons um, in the future. So I would hope that all of those get reflected um, and that you get a better index choice than just mainly Javons with one or two bits of Duto thrown in, um, more weighted index. Derek, yes, indeed. Um, it's quite interesting if you try and unpick what happened in 2010, various changes were made to the price collection of clothing data. But from everything I've seen, particularly recently, the, the real damage was done by the fact that more sales data in January, which is the um, base index for the yearly fragments of um, indices in the U in the UK, the RPI, um, was put in because it's when you get a lot of variety in the in the prices in the base month and particularly a lot of low outliers that you see Carly misbehaving. And of course, by adding sales data, more sales data in January, that was what happened. Um, certainly, yes, you can. You, I'm sure it's possible. It's not an easy job, but it can happen. And hopefully with scanner data, you'd if you incorporated scanner data into both, you would in fact narrow the gap quite a lot. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Tony. Um, well, not a lot to add to what Jill has just said, I think really. I mean, I echo uh, what she was saying. In my presentation, I tried to say that actually it's better not to rely on just one formula um, when you're compiling uh, price indices. Um, that Carly has a role, Juto has a role, and Jevons have a role. Uh, but the um, preponderance of Jevons in the CPI and CPIH is a worry, I think, because it, it, mathematically it does bias things downwards. And there is a, a logical mathematical argument about substitution that you can uh, use to justify that. But that is not, I would say, what a household cost index should be measuring. It's not supposed to assume the way people react to prices. It's supposed to be measuring the change in prices. So that's what I'd say on the in response to Kevin's uh, point um, on the clothing issue. Well, I, I don't really think I can add much to that. This is something that should have been sorted out back in 2010. It wasn't. And it's led to the uh, decade of debate that we've had and that Chris Giles uh, quite rightly criticised. Um, but I wouldn't agree with Chris on uh, the, the way it should now be resolved. But nevertheless, uh, we've seen a wasted uh, decade in terms of sorting this problem out. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, anything you you want to add to these? Uh, just to just to pick up uh, on on the uh, uh, elementary index point, uh, one of the things you know there is no perfect answer um, to to an elementary index, but I think you know the analysis we've done the analysis for example that was included in 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 the johnson review led us to think that carly is not uh, not not a good index so uh, we currently use jevons and duto in um in in cpi and hci so I, I would expect you know that 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 to continue I, I think the question of sort of trying to sort of think about collection as a way of changing index levels i mean i think the experience from 2010 
um, is that sometimes small changes in collection can have very, very large impacts. So you have to be very, 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 very careful, uh, careful uh, with those sort of issues. The other thing I would say is we are actively um, pursuing both scanner data and web scraped uh, web scraped data uh, for inclusion in, in CPI and, and C, CPIH. We have plans uh, plans for, the, for, for, for that. Um, and when you do get into those different data sources, some of these arguments about current the uh, elementary indices fall away, either because you have weights or because you have to appeal to more uh, complex something called multilateral methods, which are not invested exactly on the same uh, on the same basis as the elementary indices so i think if we were to look forward we'd probably be having a different set of debates around about those uh, about those uh, formulae for, the, for for those measures and we've published for example uh, some analysis looking at the different different methods for web scraped and uh, and uh, and scanner scanner data so but we're we're actively going down that path at the moment okay thank you jonathan so thank you to those four questioners and I read in the interest of time I've decided to read those ones out but I think we'll start now hearing a greater variety of voices so Jonathan Everett can you give me any suggestion I can see a couple of hands um, and lots and lots of stuff in the chat so what we'd like to do is try and pick at least a selection of those so any thoughts as to um, where I'm... I would maybe start with Kevin Russell who might be following up on um, his question Okay, and um, right, so um, what we might do is take two or three and then go to the panel because I want to make sure that the people who've attended this meeting get their voices. So we'll aim for two or three. So, Kevin, as you put your hand up, and your question's already been asked. And yeah, I'm not following up on the question. I'm going to ask something separate. Is that all right? Okay, go ahead. You've got the floor. Okay. Um, yeah, I think one of the central developments since the 2018 meeting was the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee report. And I've got to say that Unison's interpretation of what that report said is is, is quite a lot different from uh, what uh, John was saying earlier. Um, we thought it was an extraordinarily curt dismissal of what that parliamentary committee stated and that the UKSA actually stated that, that, that there should be a request to fix the clothing problem. We should stop treating RPI as a leg legacy measure and resume a program of periodic methodological improvement. And we're not convinced by the use of rental equivalents in CPI. And yet within 46 days, the UKS KSA had written to the Chancellor, making it plain that they were not going to fix the closing problem. They're not going to resume the programme methodological improvement and that uh, they were going to recommend precisely the, um, the uh, rental equivalents measure that um, the Economic Affairs Committee so strongly objected to. Um, but I'd just like to make, well, since this is, is probably going to be our last chance, I just would like it to make it clear just how enraged Unison is that we've got to this point now where we, we're on the verge of having, having a complete absence of a price index that is going to be relevant for wage bargaining in the UK. Okay. Thank you for that. And I won't ask and respond just yet, but um, because we'll take a couple more points. Um, so, I mean, I can see Martin Wheels had his hand up for a very long time. So perhaps we'll we'll go there first. Um, Martin. Thank you very much. Could I say, please, that I think both the society and the ONS. Martin, could, you, could you say well, Could you just say what happened during or? Sorry, I'm a professor of economics at King's College London. I'm also <clears throat> a member of the technical advisory panel on consumer price indices. Thank, thank you. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. I'm, uh, try, if I got used to it, then, then other people might remember. Could, could, could I say, please, that I think both the RSS and the ONS do a disservice in the distinction they make between economic price indices and household price indices. I know very little Greek, but I think the Greek for household is oikonomos. But perhaps more important is that I think the distinction should be between macroeconomic price indices and indices that are relevant to welfare measures. 
and that leads straightforwardly to the sort of democratic weighting that Jill has done so much to advance. A democratic weighted index is appropriate for an indicator of welfare. The corresponding measure of welfare is the geometric mean of incomes, while an arithmetic measure is appropriate to the arithmetic mean of incomes, and that isn't a terribly good welfare indicator. The reason that this matters is that actually economists have done a lot of work on social welfare indicators and price indices appropriate to them. And it is possible to put the HCIs largely in that context. But the sort of brushing aside of economics, I really think hasn't helped with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Martin. So, jo Jonathan, are there any others that you can see that we should take I mean, one more perhaps before then asking the panel to respond. Um, not just yet, I don't think. OK, so why don't I go this time? I'll go Tony, Jonathan, Jill. Tony. OK, uh, well, on uh, Kevin's uh, points, I, I'd be inclined to agree with uh, most of the points he made. I think there there is a tendency within the ONS and the UKSA to um, dismiss uh, the um, House of Lords report in its entirety and they rather seized on the points that they wanted to uh, uh, to, um, to move forward with and I think they saw it well my interpretation is it was taken as an opportunity um, to uh, do away with the RPI uh, but they didn't really fully um, appreciate what the House of Lords report was saying. I, I'd say similarly that um, I, in my view the um, the advice given by the National Statist Statistician in 2019 hasn't been fully taken on, on board in terms of the importance of the two types of measure uh, which Martin Will has described in slightly different terms. Um, I'm not sure that I would uh, want to comment on what Martin has said there in terms of uh, dismissing the arithmetic mean as having a role. Uh, I would say that uh, all these things have a role um, and uh, and need to be used judiciously. OK, thank you. Jonathan. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I have too many mute buttons. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, responding to the, on, the, on the House of Lords report, you know, we looked at the, the, those the, those issues, as I said, we considered uh, the option of of what fixing closing was. And, and again, I, I, one of the challenges has been kind of what what does that really what does that what does that really mean? We looked at that alongside other options and we decided that, you know, consistent with our overall duties and objectives that this was the best the best the best way forward the one area where we did disagree um, with the house of laws was on the rental equivalence um, issue um, the, the the rental equivalence approach had been uh, developed um, over a long period of time in consultation uh, in consultation uh, with technical experts and and more general discussions so we felt that was the one area where we didn't uh, didn't agree with the with, with the with the house of lords as i said we took on board their their option around um clothing but looked at that alongside uh, 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 alongside other options i think martin raises some really interesting uh, in, interesting points he's done some really valuable work on looking at these different different concepts of welfare um, and so i think actually there's a really interesting discussion to be had there about um, uh, to, to, to be had there about those different ways of looking at uh, uh, at uh, at income and different ways of looking at wealth so i think there's a really interesting and i, and I don't think we've really fully articulated and, and this has been a bit of an ongoing discussion really for fully articulated the sort of um, intellectual or economic or whatever you want to say underpinnings of of the household cost indices. There's, I think, there's a lot there that people are agreeing on, but I don't think we've quite developed the sort of rationale quite in the way. And I think Martin' can, it, contribution there is really helpful to continuing to test that as a as a, as a concept. Okay, thank you. And Jill. Yes. Um, I don't think I want to say too much about the House of Lords report. I do agree that I think there was a lot of good stuff in it and I would have hoped that a little more attention was paid to it. Um, but there were some things in it that I think not many, well, certainly I disagreed with some, 
some of them, and I think I'm not alone in disagreeing with some of their suggestions. Um, in fairness, I probably should point out that while they didn't like rental equivalents, I'm not fond of that one either, um, they didn't like the RPI method of do it, dealing with owner-occupied housing. So um, one can pick and choose a bit, but generally I, I would have liked to have seen more attention paid to it. Martin, um, I agree with you that using economic versus household is a bit of a shorthand and is a little oversimplistic. Um, one can do macro and micro. Um, probably none of them, as you say, really sum up the differences properly. Um, but one thing, um, I'm, this may not, I may have misread, misheard what you said, but when you talk about using the geometric mean as reflecting welfare, um, I'm not entirely sure about that, but perhaps this is probably an argument we should have some other time. But it it does if you assume that households always substitute towards um, items that have gone up um, less in price. And certainly some households, households will at times behave like that. But consumer behaviour is far more complex than economic, than economic theory can cover. And they don't always react like that. So I, I think, um, and I think there's research that shows that. So I'm, I'm not sure about that, but maybe you'll convince me a, another time. I think that's about that for now. OK, thank you. So, so we'll go some more questions and I'm going to take the one so I can see two. Well, I can see three raised hands, but I think one of them is still Kevin Russell's. So if you click on the hand again, you're a little lower. Um, but we'll have Sean Richards and then Jeff Tilley and respond to those. If you can use the raise hand function, then use that. If you can't, then if you just type in the chat, want to ask a question, then we can come to you. OK, so um, we'll, we'll do it. We'll try it that way. But anyway, Sean first, Sean Richards. So if you can unmute and maybe on video. Hello, I'm um, Sean Richards of Not Yes Man's Economics, and I'd like to ask a question about the rental equivalent subject that's come up. This is part of CPIH and will come into the RPI. However, there's the issue here that this is a complete fantasy. The concept was rejected by the House of Lords because you're assuming people that don't pay rent then actually do. And there's a secondary issue to this, which people that have followed the debate on Stats Usernet will know. I've been asking about the actual rental figures that have been used. And it turns out that they're weighted back to some extent over the last 16 months, as far as I can tell. So they're not even the actual rents anyway, in some respect, they're last years. And I'd like people to, um, the three people to respond to that point on the two issues. One, you're applying something that doesn't actually exist. Two, as we try to measure it, it's actually last year's number and not this year's. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a nice thing. I haven't had a chance to um, keep their questions brief, but actually so far everybody is. So thanks for that. So if we can then go to Jeff Tilley. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, so I'm Jeff uh, Tiley from the TDP. Uh, don't worry. Um, I've had a couple of points. Well, one just been provoked by the, the formula welfare uh, issue. I mean, my understanding was that previously the ONS had rejected the substitution argument as a way of deciding between formulas. So I'd like to have that clarified. And then I just want to go back to the House of Lords report, which I do think has been too easily disregarded. Um, in particular, they offered an important compromise uh, with the possibility of renewing the RPI. So I, I want to go back to Jonathan, because to be honest, I didn't properly understand his argument about why he rejected the clothing compromise that they offered. So I'd like him to clarify that, please. Thank you. OK, thank you. So we'll we'll take those two and remind those two, then put their hands down. Um, no, I've spoken. So perhaps we'll go in the order of the speakers again. So Jonathan, Tony and then Jill. So yeah. So, so on the rental equivalence um, uh, argument, this is it's based on uh, economic concept of essentially um, opportunity cost. That the opportunity cost of of living in your house is the inability to to, to rent it out. It's it's a, another way. Uh, it's a way I sort of see as as a practical way of uh, of deriving a user cost uh, approach uh, to use uh, 
to some of the terminology that's used in inflation inflation statistics. Um, and what we do in terms of, uh, and as I said, as I said, we've been, you know, we spent a long time developing that, thinking about the different arguments, the different uh, different approaches. That was the approach we we arrived at after very very careful consideration. Um, in terms of the data we use, we use data from uh, the Valuation Office Agency. And this is, um, just to give you a, a bit of insight into rent prices, this is a combination of new rents, i.e. what people have paid because they've moved into a house recently, and existing rents. And so therefore it's an average of, 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 of the two. We can't separately identify how many people have moved in recently, so it's a new rent and how many people have been in, in rent for a while. But essentially it's the price people are paying at this particular, the rents people are paying at this particular particular point, point in time. So in that sense, it is exactly what, what it says. It's kind of those rents, but what we're unable to do, and it's a bit different. So what some of the online uh, agencies are able to do is look at new rents versus existing rents. We're not able uh, able to do that, although we did look at part of the reason why you get different numbers sometimes from the online rentals from our, uh, compared to our own is because of this split between new and existing rents. And it tends to be that when you get new tenants, that tends to be when landlords put up, put up, put up rents and that for people who've been in uh, for a longer time, they don't see those, uh, those those rent rises. But it's essentially an average of the two, but we don't know the, the, the weights. On Jeff Tiley's point on substitution, yeah, substitution is not an argument we've, well, sorry, just to give you the full uh, explanation, um, when Paul Johnson did his review, he, he, he didn't appeal to that argument uh, to justify, um, uh, to justify, uh, um, why he didn't think uh, Carly was a good uh, was it was a good measure, and and we see without that evidence, we see there's good evidence that we don't think Carly on balance is a is a, is a good is a good index. So we don't appeal to that, um, but we do look at uh, other measures, and and on the clothing compromise, I, I think the sort of um, uh, you might have actually answered your own question there, there, there Jeff, um, because it is a compromise. I think it was very difficult because, you know, when we looked at uh, the, uh, the, the, the RPI, we saw a number of problems. Uh, the two big ones were the formula and the way the formula interacts with clothing in particular, um, and also housing. Um, um, but there are others as, as well. And, you know, the decision, and I'm, I'm probably badly paraphrasing uh, what the advice from the national statistician was that for us it it seemed didn't seem logical to fix one problem and leave essentially five others or depending on how you want to categorize them but a number of other problems uh, are unaddressed so that was that was the bulk of, that was the, the sort of message in the uh, in the national statistician's uh, 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 advice so hopefully i've covered most of the points okay thank you so we'll go to tony next OK, yeah, thanks. Um, just uh, picking up on the rental equivalence points then, um, I, I, I think there's an additional concern about um, using rental equivalence, which is that the rents people pay, uh, they pay according to the rental market. And that market is different from the owner occupied housing market. It's just a simple fact. So however accurate the ONS is able to get uh, a figure for the rents that are paid, that's great and that's appropriate for those people who are paying rent, but it is not necessarily appropriate for people who are owner occupiers. They are operating in a different market. And this might not matter if it was just a small element of the index, uh, but actually when you add up the rents and the costs of owner occupied housing, it, it, they take up a substantial portion of the, uh, the whole index. So any error that's there uh, it has a, a, a large impact on the overall index. So I think that does remain a big concern. On the substitution point, um, Jeff was quite right to think the uh, well, and as Jonathan confirmed, that it is not used as a justification for the use of any particular um, uh, arithmetic formula. But nevertheless, the fact that Jevons is used almost exclusively within the CPI and the CPIH, the mathematical properties of that um, that formula do mean that we're assuming people substitute. 
just regardless. So that's the mathematical assumption that lies there within the uh, the indexes that use it to such a great extent. And uh, my argument is that that is a problem because that is not the way that all consumers um, react. And even if they did, that is not giving us a proper measure of the price changes that uh, consumers face. Um, I don't think I need to repeat the point about the House of Lords report, so I'll stop there. OK, thank you, Jill. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, um, yes, I agree with what a lot of what Tony has just said. Um, and I, th but I think the point I want to make about substitution and economic theory. Um, I want to go back to something, a quote I may put in my presentation, which was from the 1986 advisory committee. Um, where they said for the index to be of value, it must be generally regarded as relevant to people's concerns and a fair reflection of their experience. In other words, if you're going to have an index that's used for uprating or wage bargaining or anything for wel welfare in any sense, then if it's going to be credible, you have to, it, ha it has to have some relation to what people actually pay and their experience and the big problem with rental equivalents it's very nice in theory but uh, it isn't actually what people pay in practice i'm quite fond actually of the rpi method of measuring owner occupied housing because i know it's um, um totally um doesn't agree with economic with any form of theory but to my mind it's it's a lot sort of intuitively closer to people's experience. And I do think that in some sense you, I think that is, it is important that people can, people find it credible. An index that's used for uprating, in my view, has to pass what I call the down the pub test. In other words, you have to be able to explain what you're doing with it and how it's put together, not in full technical detail, but you have to explain the substance of what you're doing down the pub so that people understand it. And that's really why I don't like rental equivalents. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, so there are no more hands up at the moment. Going back to the chat, there is actually, there's a lot of discussion that doesn't necessarily translate now. Oh, OK, as soon as I said that, um, they're putting their hands up. So um, we've got, let's see. Rachel Lisa, so we'll take Rachel. Rachel. Hi, um, I'm from Greater London Authority, um, yep. but it, that's got nothing to do with it. Um, I'm just, I know it's not in the consultation, but people have been talking about the housing costs element. And I think the one of the problems for me is that because the cost the capital cost of a house isn't included in the housing costs part, then the rental equivalence sort of makes up for that, but it's a delayed reaction. And that isn't anybody's experience. So it, it intuitively, it doesn't make sense as part of an inflation measure, as far as I can see it. So I'd like somebody to explain how it is. OK. And we've also so we'll come to that in a minute. We've also got a question. It says question to the chair, um, but I think I'd rather they person ask themselves. So long live the RPI. Um, would you want to ask your question? I've got a silence from long live. The RPI. Um, they may unmute in a minute, but um, there's also a question earlier on about why the consultation is about just about the timing rather than the substance. And actually, I haven't heard any discussion about the timing at all. So I just wondered whether the panel had any or they had any views on what were the pros and cons of either a, an early change or a late change. So perhaps um, we could take the the question we've just heard 
And then any, any comments they want to make on the timing question, uh, either why we're talking about it or or what their what their views might be. So um, perhaps we'll go Tony, Jill, Jonathan. Tony. Okay. Well, on the housing cost element uh, from Rachel, um, well, I agree basically that. Uh, uh, it's a real problem. As I said before, the rental market is a different one to the um, uh, to the owner occupied housing market. People who buy houses and sell them and live in them, uh, that they are facing different costs to those people who are renting and uh, landlords are subject to different pressures in terms of setting the rents. Uh, that they uh, that, that they want to. They presumably they're trying to maximise their rents, but they've uh, got the pressure that people not prepared to pay that much or or whatever, but it's a different market. So I agree, it, it, it's not measuring the same thing, and that's a, that in my view is a problem. In terms of the uh, question from the uh, obviously long live the RPI suggests that um, that's what they want to do, and in terms of the timing of the, any change. Well, uh, my vote would be to put it off for as long as possible. But my main criteria for that is uh, not so much to preserve the RPI forever, um, although there is, a, of course, a separate argument about having a long uh, standing um, index uh, for comparison purposes. But really, we need to give sufficient time for the household cost index to become uh, acceptable and to be fully implemented. Uh, and when they get to that point, then in my view would be the time to start thinking about uh, maybe downgrading the RPI in terms of its uh, its usage. It's already of course been downgraded officially, but uh, it is nevertheless still in widespread use because of uh, the perceived value it, uh, it retains. So that would be my answer to that question. And uh, yeah, in, in terms of replying just to the uh, the question that's uh, in the chat, um, yeah, I'm, my view is very strongly that um, if uh, the proposal is to uh, close down the RPI, that is what should be consulted on, not just the timing and how you make methodological changes, uh, as I hope I uh, said in my presentation. OK, thank you. Um, Jill. Yes, thank you. Um, to take Rachel's point, um, she's absolutely right that there isn't any element of capital costs in it. Now, it's difficult, all sorts of theoretical pros and cons about dealing with capital costs. But in my view, um, you do need some form of capital cost in there because it is an element that people pay in reality. And the I, I hope there will be some that come into the household costs indices. The plan at the moment is to develop the um, household costs indices without them and then to have a separate one which includes um, at least say more the capital element of mortgage um, payments. Um, so you, you you have that in. Um, possibly other things as well like um, contributions to pension, future pension funds and so forth. Um, I would like to see all of those in um, and um, that, you know, that to my mind would be a, a better thing. Um, and I fully agree that the using rental equivalents as a substitute is, um, it's it very, very much delays, delays it. Um, you know, yes, um, house prices feed in, the, the one element that did feed into the determination of rents, but as Rachel said, it's a very long, over a very long time frame. Uh, on the long live the RPI, well, um, I like the RPI. I think it could be there, but it has got a lot of baggage with it now, and we'll see. But I would certainly like it made into a respectable index. I probably would say that the future is with the household cost indices, wouldn't I? But given my what I've written on the subject, so I probably should declare an interest in that, but that is what I think. Um, timing, yes, again, once we have the household costs indices properly developed, then I think in a sense it becomes easier. One point I would make though, and I think it's, it's perhaps not the most important point, but it's not unimportant, is 
you mustn't get rid of the long historical legacy of the RPI and you might need that just for historical research. I'll stop there. OK, thank you. Uh, Jonathan. What would you so yeah, so, sorry, uh, apologies. Um, just to pick up on, on, on Rachel's <coughs> point, I, I mean, housing is possibly the most challenging item to deal with in, in consumer price uh, pr price inflation. And, and to get to the heart of the issue, um, a house is both somewhere you live, um, uh, um, so it provides some benefits there, but it's also an asset. And it's that dual nature that makes it very, very difficult uh, to, to measure. So if an asset, you know, if the price of a, a service or a good you buy, a price of a cup of coffee goes up, uh, you are undoubtedly worse off because you uh, other things equal, you can consume fewer of them. The problem with a house is the asset element, when the asset goes up and you own the asset, that actually makes you better off. And, and that's really the heart of all the challenges around uh, around housing it's why for example you know the, 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 probably why i'm, I'm anticipate uh, putting m motives in other people's mouths but when the rpi used mortgage interest payments it only used the interest payments not the capital repayment for that probably for exactly that that, that purpose um, but it's exactly that argumentation that leads you through to uh, to to uh, to, to the rental equivalents. The question of how long it takes to pass pass through, as I said, what we're doing is we're taking, we're, we're basing it on actual rents people are paying, and they inevitably do take some time to feed through to economic uh, economic activity. So um, there will always be some new rents that are responding to the immediate market reactions, and then there's a sort of tail of rents of existing rents that have been there for 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 for, for a while. So um, there is a uh, it, it is sort of less responsive, but it's less responsive because we're basing it on what people are actually paying at, at that particular particular point in time for rents, and then uh, applying that to the uh, uh, to the rental equivalence equivalence measure. But it's the heart, this dichotomy that houses are an asset and houses are a provider of services that is real challenge. Uh, that all the sort of different ways of measuring house uh, owner occupied housing costs um, uh, try to deal with. OK, so we're coming towards the end. In a moment, I'm going to ask um, Stephen Pennick to summarise discussion for us. So that's a hard task. If there are any urgent questions, hold your hand or hold, put your hand up or, or type in the chat now. No, I think we've come to a natural end of this part. So what I'd like to do is to invite Steve Pennick, who is the chair of the National Statistics Advisory Group to the RSS, to summarise the discussion before I formally close the meeting. So Steve, over to you. Well, thank you, Deborah, for, for chairing the meeting and also thanks to all the people. I think we've had about 80 people contributing to the meeting this evening and many thanks to them and also to those who presented and to ask questions. We're now at the stage where we will be putting together a formal RSS response to the consultation over the next few weeks. The National Statistics Advisory Group will be doing that. And the debate and the discussion that we've had this evening has been very helpful um, in enabling us to do this. Um, we will have a, a recording from tonight and we also will have, I understand, a, a, a transcription of the chat for those who's, who is kind of flown rather quickly this evening and has been difficult to assimilate all of it. I'm going to try and give a few key points that I've taken from this, but people shouldn't assume uh, this is a kind of pre-digested version, shouldn't assume that um, uh, that the digested version uh, would, wouldn't in fact include some more of the nuances which have come through from this evening. I'm grateful to Jonathan Athau for having reviewed the background to the RPI and the recent history and also Tony Cox and Jill Leyland for having told us more about the two main use cases as they see it about the macroeconomic index and the household index um, and the focus really on the need to understand the uses to which price indices are put before um, establishing how they should be compiled. We learned that there's little known about the use of price indices in business contracts and also the uses in the pensions industry and the point was made about how the pensions industry needs a clear roadmap and I think there was some understanding that there is a, a need to get this issue as it is sorted out. Chris Giles made an important point on that. Whether though this is the right solution is a matter that um, people um, 
are divided on. Um, the point was made that the delay to 2030 gives us a bit more time to work this out maybe, and it would be good if we could come up with a solution that more people could support. There were three things that came through, I think, in the general discussion that we had. Uh, people kind of referred continually back to the need for balanced analysis between the different options, uh, a need to take perhaps rather more note of the points that the House of Lords have made in their very detailed report, although of course it is a contradictory report in many ways, but there are some points there that need to be referred back to. And also there were references back to the National Stati Statistician's advice in 2017 and the need to kind of um, uh, think about what that might mean. I'm not going to go into the more technical discussion that people have been having about um, about uh, house price indices and about um, um, arithmetic forms and so on. Um, there was the question about whether the RSS should um, uh, ask that the whether the decision to kill off the RPI should be consulted on. Uh, you remember, Deborah, that you wrote to the chair of the UK Stats Authority back in last October, and I will quote what you said. You said, um, we urge you to ensure that your consultation covers what changes should be made, not just the technical aspects of how they should be implemented. So the RSS already has a position on that, and I think that position will be reflected in our consultation response, but it will be amplified by some of the very helpful comments that people have made uh, this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. So it just remains for me now to really draw the evening to a close. Um, I would like to thank, well, firstly, the speakers, because they each gave us a very clear <coughs> um, talk and they stuck to their timing and managed to put a, pack a lot into their allotted 10 minutes. And then on top of that, we have really put them to their paces to have this kind of, you know, quick fire of questions of all sorts and to do it in this sort of format where it's slightly less easy to kind of group things or to have a back and forth. So you've really earned um, whatever kind of you, you have on a, on a Tuesday evening when you need to relax. So thank you very much for that. I would also like to thank, as I've already done before, but to reiterate it, Steve Pennock for and the National Stats Advisory Group, really for everything they're doing, but in particular for arranging this meeting. Um, I would like to thank the staff because, in particular, Jonathan Everett, who is very new to the society, and uh, Nuts Martin is not so new to society, but have had the speakers on for a briefing this morning, making sure we knew how to operate the stuff. They've been keeping an eye on everything, sending out details. They really have put in a huge amount of work that's resulted in really a remarkably smooth running meeting. And my final thanks is actually to the audience and to the questioners because there are really very strongly held views in this field. You've heard many of them tonight. And so what I want to thank you for is a, making sure that we have covered all of that, but, but the respectful way in which we've had that debate, because it's really important to have debate, but it can sometimes get heated in ways that aren't helpful. And I think this has been stunning. So I have learned a huge amount um, on, I mean, I thought I'd done some homework on RPI and so on, but I've learned quite a lot of nuances I really haven't appreciated, despite my pre thatcherite economics A-level. So thank you for that. And I hope that we've got plenty of material that's going to feed through into the RSS consultation response. I would remind you, for those who weren't on earlier, that if you've got things that you want to say that you haven't put into the chat or you go away after and think I'd like to make that more cogently, you can respond to the RSS using the link that you've been sent. And of course, any individual is perfectly free to put into the consultation in their own right of their organisation. So you're perfectly free to do that as well. But at that point, I think, um, um, yeah, and the other conclusion I've drawn from this is that online consultations really have their merits. It's not just a poor substitute for the face to face meeting. It really adds another dimension. So on that note, I'm going to thank you all very much, wish you a very good evening. And um, I very much look forward to seeing the consultation and the results that come from it. A very interesting time. So thank you.